Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining our Lock and Learn EPA Prep Week. So um, before we get started this morning, we want to regroup just a little bit on our type two and clarifying some misunderstandings that we may see in the industry when we're talking about those leak rate numbers and you know where we start um, doing um, leak analysis and looking at total percentage of leak rate thresholds. If you look in your material section, and it'll also be attached with the email that goes along with the, um, with the registration, um, there is a link there, and I'll pull it up when we get to the end of the um, end of the session and talk about it. There's one from uh, it's called EPA 608 Green Chill. Um, good friends from Comores. Uh, Jeff Werther was sharing that with me yesterday, and it's just it's a nice little PDF that breaks down some of the the newer regulations that is in the EPA requirements. So we went over a lot of that stuff when we were in Type Two. And sometimes it gets a little confusing when we're talking about, you know, those 10%, 20%, and 30% leak rates. And we have to understand that that applies to systems that are 50 pounds and over, and particularly to chlorinated refrigerants, so CFCs, HCFCs. So, you know, that was one of the things that was kind of shot down when this was originally proposed is that, you know, it did work into those smaller categories, those five pound to 50 pound, which would add a whole lot of, you know, leak inspections and leak repair and a lot of documentation to the standard residential HVAC company. So that is, it's been slightly adapted to where now we're really just focusing on systems that have 50 pounds and above. And another thing that is easy to misunderstand when we're talking about our type one, type two, and type three licenses. A lot of people look at type one as being your small appliances, type two as being your residential, and type three as being your commercial. And it's really not laid out that way. When we look at what those licenses, the categories truly are covering, you know, type one is absolutely small appliances. You know, type one is going to be five pounds and under on a sealed from the factory system. So it means it doesn't have service valve, service fittings on it. Type two really is HVAC when it comes to the entire spectrum of HVAC. We're not just talking about residential, we're talking about commercial as well. And then when we get into type three, now we're really talking specifically about the low temp applications. So even on refrigeration equipment, you still need to have at least that type two. But if you're working on residential and commercial and even into the industrial HVAC, type two is a sufficient license. That's why a lot of companies only have that expectation of a type two. So we just wanna make sure that that is clear, that that type two license does cover your HVAC even into your commercial and industrial side. So. Just trying to clarify that a little bit before we dive into it. All right, well, I think we'll um, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm gonna rearrange my video real quick here just so that I can shorten up my video feeds, bring them down here. So as we get into type three, you know, we wanna understand that that is really particular to low pressure operating vessels. And many of you may never encounter these in the industry, but if you get into the commercial uh, and industrial refrigeration side, you probably will routinely. And they are a very different animal, which is why they're in a class all of their own. So um, there's a lot of things that are gonna be very different in the type three applications, because it comes with a slightly different mindset. And we'll, we'll discuss that here in just a minute. So if we're looking at you know, type three, some of the things that we're gonna cover today is going to be proper leak detection, proper leak recovery requirements, repair requirements, and charging and safety techniques because they do have some different, um, different aspects to them. So technicians who are maintaining, servicing, repairing, or disposing of low pressure, not low temperature necessarily, low pressure appliances must be certified as a type three technician or a universal technician. Most low pressure appliances are used for comfort cooling and are subject to a lower allowable leak rate. Remember, that's when we're gonna start talking about it being a comfort cooling application. Now they have different types of compressor technologies typically. Uh, a lot of them are gonna use you know, some type of a centrifugal or turbine system, but it's still a large vapor pump. Here's where the difference is when we get into type three stuff because low pressure systems operate below atmospheric pressure. 
That means they are actually operating in a vacuum. We're used to oper we're used to working on systems that are maintaining positive pressure, right? On our low side and our high side, it's constantly in positive pressure. Well, when we start talking about systems that have, you know, if it was a CFC refrigerant, it would be like R11. If it is a, uh, after a CFC, it would be HCFC, it would be 123. And now we're going to start talking about systems like R717, like ammonia. Uh, and we still have some 123 out there, but they're starting to fade away. One of the things we have to really pay attention with these systems is leaks in the gaskets or fittings because they will cause air or moisture to enter into the system. When we talk about type one and type two pieces of equipment, we're talking about systems that are constantly operating on the low side and the high side. They're operating in a positive pressure. So if we have a leak on a type one or a type two, it's gonna leak out, right? On a type three, it's just the opposite. On our entire low side of our system, it's continually operating in a vacuum. And even on our high side, we may not have much pressure at all. Our low side is constantly in a vacuum. So if there is a leak on that system, we have to completely change our mentality because I cannot use a leak detector to find a refrigerant leak on a type three system. I can use an ultrasonic that's listening, you know, like we were talking about in our flex train class on leak detectors, ultrasonic is listening to the actual high frequency sound of that leak. It's not looking for the refrigerant itself. So we got to be very mindful that our leaks are going to be at gaskets and at fittings. And when we do have a leak, it's going to leak in instead of leaking out. And that's the huge difference between type one, type two, and then the type three animals. So low pressure chillers, that's typically what we're going to be talking about is chillers, uh, require purge units because they operate below atmosphere in negative. So the primary purpose of that purge unit is to remove non-condensables that leak into the system. So, you know, if I have a leak, it's going to bring in air, right? It's gonna bring in whatever atmosphere is in that vicinity. So if we have air, we're gonna pull it into our system. If we have moisture in our air, we're gonna pull it in as well. So we use a system that is called a purge unit, and they used to be a mechanical operated system. Most of them in today's world are gonna be fully electronic systems. And what they're gonna do is they're going to look for a rise in that vacuum. They're going, just like uh, you know, we would look for, if we had air or if we had moisture in the condenser of a conventional system, we're gonna see an increase in head pressure, right? Well, it's kind of the same way with our type three systems. We're going to see an increase in our vacuum. So when we see that increase in the vacuum, that purge unit is going to start looking for the presence of air and moisture in the system. That purge unit, um, it gets its suction from the connection on top of the condenser. So the inlet to that purge unit is actually on the high side of the system where most of your non-condensables are gonna accumulate. You no, know, our condenser is probably gonna be on the roof. You know, most of these applications are gonna be commercial and industrial buildings. So they're typically gonna be outside, um, you know, that's elevated or it's gonna be up on a roof. So we're gonna pull from the top of the condenser. That's now gonna be the inlet to our purge unit. And then it's going to try to separate that. That's what it is, pur it is actually purging. So it's gonna to try to separate that air and moisture from the refrigerant and it's gonna to try to put the refrigerant back into the system. The downfall of that is even the most advanced systems cannot completely isolate all of the refrigerant from the air and the moisture. So we are going to lose a little bit, a fractional amount of refrigerant every time that purge unit is operating. And that's where the EPA steps in and goes, okay, so anytime we have a release of refrigerant to the atmosphere, we have to take that very seriously, right? That's what we do. So, you know, the head pressure of the system indicates that, that air is, is in our system. The purge unit will try to start, you know, um, adjusting and, and purging itself and getting rid of those non-condensables. What we're looking for is if we see excessive running of a purge system on these low pressure systems, that, that lets us know that we have a leak, right? You know, because that system, especially these newer ones that are um, already, they're connected in with our electronic monitoring system, it's monitoring how often that purge valve is opening because that's it's using an electric solenoid you know to when it finally does release it when it separates it and then it releases it, it's going to take a purge valve and it's going to, it's going to open and it's going to release that air back out into the atmosphere so what we're looking for is how often that purge valve has to open 
And so then we can start graphing that and we can start trending and looking for that because the more frequent that that thing starts popping, the larger the leak we know that we have. So these high efficiency purge units, which are these newer electronic style that we use, they do discharge a very low percentage of refrigerant back to the air, but it's still a release of refrigerant back to the air. So that's when we get into trying to find where these leaks are. So one of the things that, one of the tools that you have available is called a hydrostatic tube test kit. And it's used to determine if we have a leak inside of the tubes because most of these um, evaporator coils and a lot of times our condenser coils are tube and shell heat exchangers. That's all they are, it's just a heat exchanger. And I'll show you a diagram here in just a second. But the most popular way, the most common tool is using that hydrostatic tube test kit. So uh, leak testing on these low pressure systems can be a little bit of a trick because on our low side of our system, we cannot go above 10 PSIG. We're used to working with hundreds of PSIGs, right? You know, when I, when I installed that heat pump over at my daughter's house, you know, I'm test pressuring that thing with 250, 250 PSI of nitrogen looking for a leak. Um, I cannot go above 10 PSI because I'll actually blow a rupture disc on the system because they're designed to operate in low pressure. They're designed to operate in vacuum. So if they get positive pressure, it's because there's a problem. So we have to be very, very careful not to put more than 10 PSI of pressure on these things. Um, the, the low, these charged low pressure refrigeration machines may be most efficiently leak checked by adding heat with circulated hot water or blankets. And that's typically what is done. Some of the more um, advanced systems will use regular heating blankets and they're designed for these. And the heating blanket just wraps around the tube and shell heat exchanger. We apply voltage to it and it warms it up so that we're not introducing any nitrogen into the system. We're using the refrigerant that is inside of the system already. We're just gonna add heat to it so that we can make our refrigerant expand, you know, and, and get that refrigerant to go from a vacuum to just a few PSI. So not a lot, it doesn't take a whole lot of heat to do that. Because if we can get just a few PSI, now we have a positive pressure where we can look for a leak. But if we're working on systems that are using like 717 ammonia, that's one of the reasons we operate in these low operating conditions, low pressure systems. If we are working with ammonia, we cannot let it escape. If I have a, a, an ammonia system and I'm working in a positive pressure inside and I have a leak, I'm going to push ammonia into the atmosphere, right? And I'm going to kill people. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do yeah. that. I have to operate in a vacuum. That way, if I have a leak, all it's going to do is suck air into the system. So it's a completely different mindset than what we're used to. So to reduce refrigerant loss from that purge unit on, let's say, like an R123 chiller, we always leak test and repair that system. We don't let it continue running when we know that we have a known leak. So a low pressure refrigeration system could have a leak in the condenser or in the chiller barrel tubes if excessive moisture continuously collects in the purge unit. So we can actually slightly determine where our leak is based on if our purge unit is releasing air back, you know, vapors back into the atmosphere or whether it's releasing moisture. And so a lot of these modern purge units are actually measuring the content of moisture that is in that air that it's releasing. Because if it's a tube and shell, I've got liquid passing through either my tube or my shell, depending on the design of it. So if I leak in my tube and shell heat exchanger, it's got water in it or glycol, and it's going to pull that into our system. So if I have excessive moisture coming out of my purge unit, I know that it is coming from either my evaporator tube and shell heat exchanger or my condenser tube and shell heat exchanger. So it just helps uh, focus on where that's at. Because our tube and shell heat exchanger has got gaskets, it's got seals inside of it where everything bolts together. And so that's typically where we're gonna have our problem. So if it is only air coming out of the system, it's in our line sets. If it is moisture coming out of our purge unit, it's in one of our heat exchangers. So to prevent air accumulation into an idle low pressure system, because remember, so say it's on a, a shutdown for leak inspection. If I had air in there, um, we, we have to maintain that system slightly above atmospheric. We can't let it get too warm, right? 
So we've got to be real careful with the pressure and we have to monitor the pressure that's inside of that. Uh, moisture most frequently enters the refrigeration system in low pressure chillers through leaks from areas with gaskets or fittings. And then, like I said, it's typically going to be at the, um, the evaporator heat exchanger or at the condenser heat exchanger. So to check for a leak, um, one of the easy things to do is to, on that tube and shell heat exchanger, so for those of you who have never seen one before, um, let's at least talk about the design of them. On a tube and shell heat exchanger, if we look at this particular one, let me grab my highlighter so I can show you what's going on. So this one here would be a condenser. So what that tube and shell heat exchanger is doing is it has either municipal water or well water coming into the shell of our condenser. This is going to be an entire condenser coil right here. The water goes into the shell, it goes around the tubes that are inside of it, and then as it comes out, it's typically going to go into a drain. If it's on a, um, a closed loop system, it's just going to get pumped back into a tank, but we still have the opportunity to bleed off a little bit out of that drain. And then we can use a leak detector, because remember, if I have refrigerant that is leaking in my system, there's a good possibility it's going to be in the water that comes out of the drain. And a lot of these just go, it's just a well. So it's pumping up well water, it's going into the condenser and the water is going right back down into the drain for that well. So our water is going to come out down here. So we can put our leak detector right down to the drain and see if we have it. So if we're working on a condenser coil, we can literally, and we do, it's one of the places we always check, we look at the water coming out of that shell to see if we have any refrigerant leak because we would be coming off from our compressor on the refrigerant side, coming out of the compressor. Remember, high temperature, high pressure vapor. We're going to pass through these tubes. So there's a gasket. Well, there's typically a couple of gaskets here. And at the other end, our refrigerant is going to, as it passes through here, what's it going to do in a condenser coil? Okay. Condense down to liquid right so by the time we come out of here we are now liquid refrigerant so we have removed heat by our water so on the high side of this system if i have a leak in my tubes or in my gaskets i'm going to put a little bit of that refrigerant in the water and then i can go down there with my leak detector and i can find that in the water uh, i actually do this even with uh, water cooled ice machines if you have a leak in a condenser on a water-cooled ice machine, the same principle comes to play. So geothermal, too. Geothermal will be the same. Anytime we're using water on our condenser coil, we can use that leak detection. And so it gives us an opportunity to look for a leak. So if we find a leak, you know, we drain the water sides of the evaporator and condenser prior to recovering refrigerant from a chiller suspected of having tube leaks. You know, if we think about that, especially on our evaporator coil, condenser is pretty well the same way. If I leave that water inside of that shell, what's going to happen when I pull that refrigerant out of there? I'm going to boil my refrigerant as I'm pulling it out of there. So then I have the potential of freezing the water that's on those shells. I've seen, I've seen people burst those shells. And you, you wouldn't think that a quarter inch steel would burst from refrigerant, uh, but it does. It bursts from refrigerant that's freezing water into ice. And ice is a pretty damaging you know, material. So we have to be cautious when we're pulling refrigerant out of those systems. All right, so on uh, low pressure refrigeration systems with open drive compressors, remember that is just a compressor that has a shaft coming out of it with a seal and we're using some type of a, a motor to turn it. Typically it's a large electric motor. Sometimes it can be diesel driven. I've seen diesel driven motors on these before too. You know, if they're in places where they don't have enough electrical, they use a diesel engine to turn the compressor pump. Um, those shaft seals are particularly susceptible to leaks. So we want to take a look at those shaft seals really, really well. So according to ASHRAE guideline three, remember anytime we're talking about air quality and safety, it's going to be an ASHRAE code. So guideline three, the system should be checked for leaks if during a system vacuum test, the pressure in the system rises from one millimeter of mercury to a level above 2.5. So they're just saying, if we change one and a half millimeters, we got a leak somewhere. You know, if we talk about when we're doing leak checks on our, uh, if we're doing an evacuation on a system and we're bringing it down to 250 microns or whatever, and then we you know, look for it to rise and then stop, 
Well, that's telling us that we've got moisture. If it continues to rise, then we've got a leak. Well, in these low pressure, you know, we're not working with such wide ranges that we do in type one and type two. So we're just looking for it to rise from one millimeter to a level above 2.5. Good numbers to know. Now, if we're talking about uh, leak rates, EPA leak repair requirements apply to all appliances using a regulated refrigerant. So any chlorinated or fluorinated refrigerant. Once the threshold leak rate has been exceeded, remember that's your 10%, 20%, or 30%, on any system using an ozone depleting refrigerant with a charge of 50 pounds or greater, that's our key, 50 pounds, the owner must repair the appliance to bring the leak rate below the threshold, retrofit, or retire the appliance. Uh, it still blows my mind that you know we have lobbyists just like when we had the 608 and the 609 separation and you can have you didn't have to have a license to go buy a one pound container of r134a you had to have a license if you're buying a 30 pounder but if it was one pound you can just go down to your local hardware store and buy it you used to buy that crap at rule king and menards you can 30 of them yeah you can go buy all you want okay hey, i'll take a skid of those one pound containers yeah no problem you want a five percent discount yes please yeah. well so we still have lobbyists interjecting with our rules and regulations you know if i was building if i was the epa and i was building a program to teach people how to um to minimize the amount of refrigerant i, I wouldn't say bring the leak rate below the threshold i'd be like fix the dang leak fix it, it nah, I'll, I'll not go on my ramp but all right as of January 1st, 2019, and Brian and I were looking over this. Brian gave me a call yesterday and we was looking at this. We may possibly have already gotten into our legislation. It may be semi-approved for this now. So it was going to happen in 2019. It got pushed to 2020, but it looks like we are going to be in effect. The applicable maximum leak rates, right? So no matter what piece of equipment it is, doesn't matter if it's type 1, type 2, or type 3. What really matters is what is it being used for? If it is a comfort cooling, if it is air conditioning, it's a 10% leak rate. Even all these great big mammoth systems that have got a thousand pounds of refrigerant in it, 10% if that system is being used for comfort cooling. If it is for commercial refrigeration, it's 20%. If it is an industrial process refrigeration, it's going to be a 30%. Very, very key numbers. We talked about that in the other certification classes. So chillers generally belong to the EPA leak repair category of comfort cooling because a lot of these chillers are being used for you know, large buildings. And so they're primarily used for comfort cooling. Uh, when used in multiple categories, the applicable maximum leak rate is determined by the highest percentage of use. So Greg was talking about this a little bit. So say I've got a 100 ton chiller. Say it's got 100 pounds of refrigerant in it. If, it, if they use 55% of the chiller's capacity for cooling and 45% or is um, or for manufacturing and 45% is used for air conditioning in the offices, which happens all the time, the chiller is considered to be an industrial because it has majority of it being used for the actual manufacturing side. Uh, so a lot of times they'll engineer these so that it's primarily used on the 30% instead of the 10%. So. Is what it is. All right. So use the charge stated on the equipment nameplate to determine a chiller's nominal charge for leak rate calculations. You know, by the time you get into pieces of equipment that have 50 pounds of refrigerant or more, they are typically and should be commissioned, right? So when we commission a piece of equipment, we're looking at the total refrigerant that's in each component, and then we're also calculating how much refrigerant is in our line sets. A good technician is going to write that number down along on the line plate, on the name plate, so we know exactly how much refrigerant was in the original installation. So the leak rate of an appliance using an ozone depleting refrigerant must be calculated when topping off or recharging a system due to a loss. So if I'm a service technician, even if I have never been up to this piece of equipment before, we're a new contractor to this piece of equipment, um, and we're here to take a look at this thing, and I find that my 100 pound system is being used for industrial processing, and I just put 31 pounds of refrigerant in this 100 pound system. I have now hit my leak rate threshold. I've had 30%. So I have to calculate what that total system is. And it might take a little bit of work, 
you know, if I'm talking about like a commercial VRV system, that's probably going to have 50 pounds of refrigerant in that system. I can actually have to, I may have to go back to the original engineering data to find out what the original refrigerant charge was for that system. Because what if I put 31 pounds in it and I go, oh, okay, I hit my leak rate threshold. But then, because my nameplate says that my outdoor unit had 100 pounds. And then I go look at my system and I find out, oh, well, I may actually have 140 pounds in this total system, which has changed your leak rate threshold. So it's things to be aware of is that you need to know what that total refrigerant charge is for a system. And if you're walking up on a piece of equipment and you don't know how much refrigerant is in that, don't start adding refrigerant until you find out how much refrigerant was originally in that system. Just so you have good proper documentation. Because if you hit one of those leak rate thresholds, you are now repairing and you are documenting. If an appliance with 50 pounds or more of a regulated refrigerant charge has exceeded the threshold rate, the owner or operator has 18 months to retrofit or retire the appliance if the replacement appliance will use a refrigerant exempt from the venting prohibition. So what they're saying is, you know, we've always talked about you got 12 months, 12 months, 12 months, 12 months. Well, you have 12 months to fix it, yes. But if you are planning to retrofit that refrigerant, you actually can have up to 18 months, but you got to document that. So if I have a system that is going from a regulated refrigerant to a non-regulated refrigerant, so say I'm going to um, remove the refrigerant out of this system and I'm going to flush the system and I'm going to put in a non-regulated refrigerant, well, then that can be extended to 18 months. That comes into play a lot of times in the manufacturing world so that they can um, plan a scheduled shutdown of that facility so a lot of times they'll look at that and they'll go, hey, either I, ha I can fix this and put the same refrigerant back in here, but it's gotta be fixed within 12 months, or if we wanna go ahead and convert to a exempt refrigerant, then we, we actually got 18 months that we can fix this. So it gives them a little bit more time to do the repair if they're gonna put in a less um, ozone depleting refrigerant. Uh, not having a certified service technician available for a service cannot be used as a reason to extend the appliance. So that company cannot on the report go, hey, I didn't get it fixed in 12 months because I couldn't find a certified service technician. Well, they're just saying, too bad, find one. Um, system mothballing does not require removing the appliance or storing it in a warehouse uh, at the facility. So what we talked about with mothballing is if I have a system that has multiple compressors, and I have a leak on a gasket on one of my compressors. On our larger pieces of equipment, we have service valves on our, at the suction side of our compressor, at the discharge side of our compressor. And if we have a oil balance line going between the compressors, we have a place to isolate our oil right there. And even if we have a crankcase pressure balance line going between the compressors, we have valves to isolate that. So what they're saying is if you can mothball, if you can isolate that system, you're okay. The downfall is, is we now lose the capacity of that compressor. Yeah. So, you know, you can get by, but now you're gonna get by with less capacity. If, um, if an appliance containing 50 or more pounds of an ozone depleting, remember what's ozone depleting? Chlorine, if it's a chlorinated, a CFC, HCFC, has exceeded the threshold leak rate, the owner or operator has 30 days to repair the appliance so that it leaks below the threshold. 30 days. If that's got R22 in it, R410A in it, 30 days. That's why so many people are going to CO2. It's exempt. If I have a leak on a CO2 system, I just go buy some more CO2. That's it. If a chiller with a charge of 200 pounds of an ozone depleting refrigerant, remember chlorofluorocarbon or hydrochlorofluorocarbon, has passed the initial verification leak test, so we fixed our leak, a follow up verification test must be conducted within 10 days. That means I got to come back again. Even though I have verified that I have fixed this leak, I still, if it's an ozone depleting, I still have to come back within 10 days and recheck my system that I just checked. The owner operator of the equipment is responsible and must keep records of all leak inspections, initial verifications, and any completed leak repair follow-up verifications and keep those for a period of three years. So three years is gonna be the key for all of our documentation. Now, if we get into some recovery techniques, we've got a few things to consider on these low pressure systems. 
Um, the high pressure cutout control on a recovery unit used for evacuating the refrigerant from a low pressure chiller is typically set to 10 PSIG. So I cannot take my standard G5 twin and go put on that system. That G5 twin, I've, I've ran mine into very high pressures before. I won't say how high, but very high. Um, so if I'm using it on these very low pressure systems, I have to have a cutout pressure of 10 PSI. I go, man, why, why 10 PSI? Well, if remember, we had a 10 PSI rupture disc on our evaporator coil. So I, I have to maintain my low pressure on these systems. Because if I'm using that push-pull method with my recovery, and I'm taking vapor off my tank and I'm putting it back into my system, 10 PSI, that thing blows. So due to the volume of liquid refrigerant in these large systems, refrigerant removal from a low pressure system starts with liquid removal followed by recovery of the vapor. So I want to try to pull that out of there pretty quickly. After all the liquid has been removed, an average 350 ton R123 chiller, so R123 is a hydrochlorofluorocarbon. Even if I bring that down to zero, because remember these systems are used to operating in a vacuum. These are very low pressure refrigerants. If all I do is recover my system down to zero, because on this system I probably had six, seven, maybe 800 pounds of refrigerant on this 350 ton chiller. If I only bring it down to zero, it's not sufficient even remotely close to make that system safe to open up. If I only brought this system down to zero, I would still have approximately 100 pounds of refrigerant trapped as vapor inside of that system. Because you know we're not talking about three eighths and, and seven eighths line sets. You know, we're talking about maybe six inch suction lines. Yeah, That's a lot of volume. And on our tube and shell heat exchangers, we probably got inch and a half tubes inside of there. And some of these heat exchangers are three or four feet in diameter. That's a lot of capacity in vapor state. So we have to really pull these down into nice deep vacuums, even just on doing our refrigerant recovery. So the use of a severely oversized vacuum pump could cause trapped water to freeze when evacuating system. And we talked about that even with our residential stuff. You know, the old rule of thumb is one CFM per ton is typically what we needed in a residential system. So if I was doing a five ton system, I, I don't need any more than five CFM on my vacuum pump. I teach most guys three CFM is appropriate. So, you know, we have to be aware that pulling a vacuum too fast is going to cause refrigerant to boil very rapidly, which could cause water to freeze. And especially in these tube and shell heat exchangers that have water or glycol in them, we just have to be careful of that. We just have to know what size of equipment we're pulling. So if we're working on a little bitty package system, you know, because we could have a type three system that's running R123 and all it does is chills a um, a cooler, you know, a, a, a lab cooler. It may only have a couple of pounds of refrigerant in it. If I hook a 12 CFM water cooled recovery unit or vacuum pump up to that thing and I pull all that refrigerant out, I'm going to freeze something in a hurry. So we've got to be careful about that. So during evacuation, and dehydration of a system containing large amounts of moisture, it may be necessary to break the vacuum using nitrogen. They say maybe, I say absolutely. Every system that you do, you break with nitrogen. You do a triple evacuation. You pull it down, break it with nitrogen. Pull it down, break it with nitrogen, then pull it down again. That nitrogen is going to help dissipate any moisture droplets that we have suspended in the air, and it's going to pull it out much easier. If you look at that little video that we did with that Dyke and Fit system, you know we're doing a push-pull system. We're actually using nitrogen to help push out any uh, vapor out of our system, and it helps speed things up. So I highly recommend um, using nitrogen for your breaking your vacuum. Uh, increasing the pressure with nitrogen prevents the moisture from freezing and increases the speed of dehydration. It's, we use this for all three classes. Uh, a water-cooled recovery unit will allow for faster recovery of large quantities of refrigerant. People say, well, how big is that? Are you gonna have recovery units that will, can pull you know, 100 CFM, but they're gonna be water-cooled and they're gonna be on carts and have three quarter inch water lines, sometimes bigger. So they take a little bit of work to hook up. Uh, water is circulated through a chiller during refrigerant evacuation to prevent freezing of water in the plant. So it's basically just keeping the pump moving, keeping that circulating pump so that our water is not sitting there stationary, you know, and attempting to freeze. It's just like in the middle of winter, if you have, you know, lines that are notorious for freezing and busting, you just crack it and let that water trickle through, right? And then it won't freeze because it's not stationary long enough to freeze. Same principle. Now, if we... Um, 
We look at the system's water pumps, recovery compressor and recovery condenser water should all be on during vapor and liquid removal from a low pressure system, same thing. Raising the temperature of the room in which a low pressure chiller is located will help speed up the recovery. I've seen them do that. Just have you know wall heaters just to warm up that space, just to make that recovery go a little bit faster. One of the keys of doing that is when removing refrigerant oil, it should be heated to 130 degrees um, as less refrigerant will be contained in the oil at those higher temperatures. So a lot of them actually around the compressor will have heating blankets or heaters that is used to warm up that uh, compressor to make sure that we can boil off our refrigerant out of our oil before we pull the oil out. Last thing we wanna do is pull out 50 gallons of oil out of this great big system just to find that those 50 gallons of oil has got 30 pounds of refrigerant still trapped inside of it. So be careful when heating this system because that ruptured disc on the recovery vessel for low pressure refrigerant relieves at 15 PSI. So our recovery vessel. So they say recovery vessel, that's typically a lot of times we have uh, basically a receiver on these pieces of equipment and that will be the recovery vessel. But if you're using a recovery cylinder, it's still 15 PSI. So you'll see those numbers at 10 PSI on our equipment and 15 on our recovery vessel are very important numbers to know. So after reaching the required recovery vacuum on a low pressure appliance, wait a few minutes to see if the system rises before charging. You know, we're looking for a leak. When leaks in the appliance make evacuation or recovery to the described levels unattainable, don't proceed. Still got a leak, it's got to be found and got to be fixed. Um, recovering and recycling equipment must be labeled as certified to meet EPA's requirements. So got to keep modern equipment. Uh, replacing or repairing a compressor, condenser, or evaporator is considered a major repair, just like it is in, in every other category. So when making a non-major repair, warming the liquid refrigerant in the system with hot water or warming blankets will bring the system pressure out of vacuum. All it does, it just warms it up just enough to get it a couple PSI uh, positive. So before disposing of a low pressure appliance, the refrigerant must be recovered and evacuated to 25 millimeters of mercury. So it's pretty low. That's because we have to make sure we get all that refrigerant out of there. Recovery records for disposed appliances with five to 50 pounds of refrigerant must be kept for three years. Basically saying everything, three years. You wanna keep all of our records. Uh, before evacuation recovery or dehydration, an oil sample should be taken to the unit to see if you've had compressor burnout, just a very simple oil test kit. Also, when evacuating or dehydrating a system, it contains a large amount of moisture, triple evacuation. I keep saying that because it works. Now, if, um, if servicing or evacuating a uh, chiller, refrigerant vapor is reintroduced into the chiller to a pressure which corresponds to a saturation temperature above freezing. So you just look at your PT chart for whatever refrigerant you're using and go, okay, if my, I look at my PT chart and I go, okay, at this refrigerant at 33 degrees is this pressure. Well, when I'm charging this system, I actually want to introduce vapor first to get up to that point. That way I'm not introducing liquid in there because what's going to happen when I put that liquid in? It's going to boil and it would freeze my water. It's all about keeping that water from being frozen. So just put it in vapor first, just until you get your pressure to come up but right above your PT chart that says here's 32 degrees. As soon as I get right above that, then I can introduce my liquid. Uh, then I'll prevent the liquid from uh, freezing the water in the heat exchanger tubes. So as an example, if I was using refrigerant R245FA, Charging liquid R245FA into a low pressure refrigeration system in a vacuum greater than 18 inches will cause the system water to freeze. So we have to make sure that our vacuum goes all the way up to 18 before we even start introducing liquid into that system. So just be mindful of that PT chart because of what if I was using a different one? So, so I was used looking at my PT chart. Now on this particular system, I'm using R123 instead of 245. Um, it should have a vapor pressure above 20 inches of vacuum before adding liquid. So I bring that thing all the way from you know, wherever my, my low point was, 250 microns, and then I don't add liquid until I get to 20 inches. Uh, liquid refrigerant is charged into the system using the, it's called an evaporator charging valve. This is important to know because all of these low pressure systems have an evaporator charging valve, and it's the lowest point on a low pressure system. So it is at the very, very bottom of our entire refrigeration circuit, and that's where we put that refrigerant in, in liquid form. Uh, the relationships found on the PT charts um, will vary slightly from one manufacturer or publisher to the next. Um, the, pressure, or, uh, uh, the pressures are normally indicated in PSIG. 
So to convert an absolute PSI A to a gauge pressure, so we've you know, we've zeroed our gauges to atmospheric pressure, we typically have about a 14.7 uh, PSI difference. So just be mindful of if you're if you're reading on your PT chart is in PSI A or PSI G. And it's the same way for anything, even when we're calculating our um, compression ratio. When we were talking about that on our compression ratio class, you know, when we crack our hoses and we zero our gauge to zero, we are balancing that to atmosphere, which already has pressure on it, 14.7 PSI typically. So we have to account for that 14.7 PSI difference between PSI A and PSI G. Really comes into you know, where that equipment was manufactured. Different parts of the world use PSI A and others use PSI G. Um, one thing they do want you to know a little bit about is um, you'll see a reference in there called threshold limit value versus time weighted average. What does that all mean? How much exposure over a period of time? That's all it's really saying. So when a unit, so this particular one is using a, an older uh, CPC system. Um, so those, that's actually fairly old. Uh, those, most of those have all been replaced with E2 style, um, Einstein E2 systems. The, um, when the system is, it calculates refrigerant leaks, right? So in a mechanical room, where our compressors are, where all of our machinery is at, we're going to have a refrigerant leak detection system. Either like this CPC, that particular controller has been around a long time. Those controllers are using sensors to monitor the amount of refrigerant that is in that space over a period of time. That is your threshold limit value versus your time weighted average. ASHRAE standard 15, 2013, which has had some amendments, but that was when we really, 2013 is when this really became into effect. It requires that each mach machinery room activate an alarm and a mechanical ventilation system. So when you go into these uh, commercial and industrial facilities that have all of this machinery in its room, you're going to notice a control on the wall like this. You're going to notice some sensors on the wall. You're typically going to notice some louvers on the outside wall, and you're going to notice some exhaust fans. And what happens is when this detector meets its threshold limit value versus time weighted average, it's going to say, hey, that means I am leaking enough refrigerant in here that it is unsafe. For breathing. I'm going to trigger an alarm. It's going to go into your automated alarm system or turn on some lights or bells or whatever your system is tied into, and it's going to activate the mechanical ventilation system, which means the mechanical louvers on the wall are going to open up and the exhaust fans are going to turn on. So if you drive around the backside of pretty much every um, large grocery store here in the United States, if you drive around the backside of it, you're going to notice a wall with a bunch of filters on it, mesh filtering. That is your incoming air and they have mechanical louvers on the inside and then right above that you're going to have exhaust fans on the roof so the machine rooms are monitoring refrigerant leaks because you know if i have a compressor blowout or condenser blowout or evaporator blowout that's where my refrigerant is going to be is in that machine room so ashray standard 15 23 of 2013 also requires the use of a room sensor and alarms to detect refrigerant leaks in all refrigerant safety groups so anytime we have a big machinery room no matter what refrigerant it is, we're going to have some kind of leak detection. R123 refrigerant is classified as B1. So the, it's a uh, it's not flammable, but it's very toxic, right? So we have to make sure those systems are capable of removing all that refrigerant when we have a leak. Uh, refrigerant 1233ZD, that's a newer one. That's one of our HFOs. Um, it's classified as an A1, non-flammable. Uh, it's low toxicity under standard 34. So um, section the standard 15 and 34 go hand in hand in our industry. It's the design for our safety and well-being. Uh, the use of room sensors and alarms to detect refrigerant leaks in all refrigeration safety groups is required not only because of refrigerant characteristics, because refrigerants are heavier than air and can displace oxygen. That could be down low. You know, gloves and safety goggles should be worn when working with any liquid refrigerant. Uh, the discharge from a ruptured disc or pressure relief valve should be piped outdoors to prevent venting into machine room. And, you know, it makes sense. You know, if I have a high pressure rupture disc on my system, I don't want it inside the building. I want it outside. 
So we actually add those. And even our, our standard refrigeration systems that are using like our 404A, we actually have rupture disc, high pressure rupture disc. So another thing, if you're driving by a grocery store and you see a large condenser sitting on the roof, uh, that's for your refrigeration system, your refrigeration racks, you'll actually see those high pressure rupture valves. So not only are these low pressure systems using rupture valves, uh, a lot of our medium and uh, low temperature stuff are as well. Uh, pressure relief valves should be piped or installed in parallel, never in series, because it you know reduces the operating or increases the operating pressure of them. Um, a 15 psi rated rupture disc is located on the evaporator of a centrifugal chiller. So when charging ref refrigerant is introduced through the evaporator charging valve, which remember is on the bottom, um, make sure it's not to overpressure the system. Cannot go over 10 psi really. We hit 15. We're gonna lose all that charge we just put in there. Uh, isopropyl alcohol should be used to remove um, ice from a sight glass. Don't use your torch and don't use your hand. And that really gets us through all of our type three. So you know, a lot of um, interesting stuff with type three, a lot of people are very afraid of type three and don't even study for it when they're taking their universal test. Um, it's really only scary to people because they just don't use it. They don't see it and they don't interact with it. You know, most of us technicians are hands-on people. We understand things once we get our hands on it and we tear things apart. It's just how we work. Well, these low pressure appliances are such a different animal that a lot of people are afraid of them. Just always remember, everything that you're studying, everything that you're investing into to take this test is about one principle. Don't let it out. It's all about not allowing the refrigerant to escape. So even on these type three low pressure vessels, if I have a leak, it's gonna leak into the system, but my purge valve is gonna pop it out to the atmosphere, right? So that purge unit is critical on these low pressure systems to let us know if we have a leak in our system. And if we do, we just have to be careful with our procedures, which we pretty well covered. We don't go above 10 PSI. We have rupture, emergency rupture disc set at 15. Our recovery equipment is set at 15. It's very low operating pressures, but it's really not any different than anything in type one or type two. If we have a leak, what are we gonna do? We're gonna go try to find it and fix it. If it is above 50 pounds on any system, now we're gonna have to actually determine how much refrigerant we put in to see if we're gonna have to document this further. And if we do hit that leak rate threshold, we're going to have to fix our leak. And if it was a chlorinated refrigerant, we've got to come back in 10 days and make sure. It's all about these chlorinated refrigerants, ozone depleting refrigerants, and the GWPs, the global warming potential of refrigerants. But primarily it's about these chlorinated refrigerants because there are still a lot of systems out there that have R22. Think about that one example that I was telling you guys about. 1400 pounds of HCFC R22. 10 minutes. So it's all about finding leaks and fixing leaks.